There is no great chance of observing this phenomenon. That is what was the conclusion of Albert Einstein with regards to gravitational lensing. That is true, kind of, because it's a rare phenomenon. But today, more Ogle collaborations, they're discovering hundreds and hundreds of these events, microlensing events. Um, I'm, do I'm doing my PhD candidacy under Dr. Nicholas Rattenbury, and I'll be discussing GPU accelerated modeling of microlensing events using open source technologies. Um, I will revisit some of the uh, relevant concepts to gravitational microlensing, so I, I apologize if it sounds uh, repetitive. <coughs> Please don't fall asleep. <laughs> um, and then I'll go through the modeling process that I use to model these microlensing events using open source resources and uh, finally present you with the modeling results that I obtain. So here we have a light curve for a single lens event. Gravitational microlensing as Martin uh, elaborated on. Light from a, uh, a distant source bent due to the a gravitational potential of a lens, foreground lens object. Um, and this is a corresponding magnification map, which, which I will be um, talking about more uh, later. What we see here is uh, as the source, source star approaches a lens star, you can see corresponding increase in the brightness. So. Um, also, this this parameter determines how how what the peak magnification is going to be, right? So the red the red source track. This is the source track, which is quite far away relative to the yellow one. So that's a tiny tiny peak compared to the yellow one over there. Um, uh, compared to that, if we have multi lens multi-lens systems, for example, a planet orbiting a host star, then we have deviations to the bell-shaped curve. Uh, we have bumps or dips, and this is what we look for. Uh, this is a typical planetary signal. This is what tells us, okay, we have, a, we have perhaps a planet orbiting a host lens star. Um, consider the simple geometry and uh, skipping all the mathematical derivations we have a, a simple lens equation where theta e is the uh, angular radius of the Einstein radius um, of the Einstein ring. Einstein ring is a ring, uh, Martin showed you a Hubble uh, image of it, Einstein ring is what we get when we have perfect alignment of the source, observer, and the lens. Um, over here we have a deflection angle, which is the only input from the theory of uh, gravitation, uh, theory of general rel relativity. So that is the only input. Other than that, don't care. Um, my multiple lens systems geometry, a planet companion to the lens star, and we generalize the uh, lens equation, which I showed in the previous slide, to this in complex coordinate system, where we have uh, W and Z, the source and image positions, respectively. That, that's what you need to know. We'll be using this equation later on in modeling. So the microlensing modeling problem is essentially find a set of model parameters to best fit the observation in our girl collaborations. And what we suffer from is the curse of dimensionality. Why? Because for a single lens event, we have only three parameters. That's easy enough to model. For a multiple lens system, we have three additional parameters. Add more lenses, we'll get even more parameters. And now, uh, over here we just take into account uh, the additional parameters are due to, uh, we take into account the finite size of a source star, for example. In the single lens case, we just assume point source, point lens. 
and then high order effects we take into account finite size of the source. We take into account um, the orbital motion of the planet around the host star and so on. So we suffer from the curse of dimensionality. We have um, um, for multiple lens systems we have higher dimensional problems. So th that, that is where the challenge is. Now micro lensing modeling is an inverse problem. Why? Because we know the position of the source and we need to find <coughs> the position of the images. So we need to invert the lens equation. Inverting the lens equation, um, for a single lens event, we are able to get an analytical expression. Inverting this equation for a single lens event will give us a quadratic equation. We for a multiple lens system, it gets harder and harder. Um, n squared plus one polynomial degree polynomial, right, for multiple lens, for, where n is the number of lenses we have. So we use a numerical technique, inverse ray shooting. This is a magnification map. Um, I sh I showed you a magnification map of a single lens event whereby we had a nice circular geometry, a uh, circular pattern with the lens in the center. This is for a binary lens. And this is not what we see in the sky. This is a mathematical representation of the lens plane. Right? Inverse ray shooting is whereby billions of rays are shot from the um, from the observer plane, through the lens plane, and onto the source plane, backwards. These are closed curves of very high magnification. On this mathematical representation of the lens plane, we have these curves, the concave curve, that's called a fold, and the point where they meet are called cusps. Okay, um, so this is a magnification map. Each point on the map represents the amplification value. Right, um, it's for this configuration where Q is the mass fraction and D is the separation of the planet from the host star. And then we project a source track onto the lens plane, right, at, a, at an angle alpha to the um, observer lens uh, line of sight um, at a distance of mu naught from the lens, the center. Right, and that re represents a model path of the source star. Over here we can see it grazing a cusp and cutting the curves at two points, cutting two, two, fold, two folds. Right, then we read we read the values on the magnification map along the source track and we get a unique light curve. Over here we can see corresponding to where the source track um, grazes the cusp we can see a, a bump, a rise and then a fall of the amplification, the x-axis, uh, sorry y-axis, right? And then where it cuts the the folds, we get two spikes, right? These are very high magnification curves. Searching for the best fit light curve then is, um, it involves searching uh, thousands of these magnification maps, which means creating hundreds of thousands of light curves, which makes this process a very time consuming and computationally expensive process. Um, over here you can just see three light curves with all the other parameters same except for mu naught and alpha, right, which is that, those parameters. Now imagine creating hundreds of thousands of light curves, right. Now the code that I'm using is uh, developed has been developed by Joe Ling, who did his PhD at Mace University under the supervision of Dr. Ian Bourne. And it is 
to become open source. He is doing his postdoc at the moment. What is, what is so great about his code? Well, what I like about his code is that it's GPU accelerated. It is executed on a Linux system and it has a pretty Python packaging. Right. I'll, elaborate, I'll elaborate on this more. GPU accelerated code, GPUs are massively parallel processing units and they're comparable to high performance cluster computing, right, for my purpose. Um, for example, the code that I'm using, the CPU version of it will take days, weeks, or months, depending on the complexity of the microlensing event that I will be modeling on a desktop, right? But the GPU version will take hours. So it's super speedy. And this is the technology that we are using. NVIDIA Tesla K20 with its impressive specifications, crazy large number of processor cores, with its crazy speed, and same for its memory, right? Mm. The other thing about it is that I can run it on a Linux system remotely, which means I can walk from home. A code, I can run a code from home, a code that traditionally would need access to cluster computing facilities. Now, myself, I'm a Linux newbie. I started using Linux six months ago. I always do things the hard way. I jumped in in the deep end. In the, at the deep end, I learned how to access the server before I learned how to make a directory, how to copy and paste, things, tasks, simple tasks that you take for granted when you're using Windows. So if I had to give a small piece of advice to any Linux beginner, take the time out to learn the basics from a book. Um, this is a good book which I have still not read. <laughs> well, the first few pages suggest it's a good book. <laughs> Practice what you preach, which I don't know. Um, yeah, Python with CUDA. CUDA C is an extension to C programming language, which requires specialist GPU, specialist GPU programming knowledge, which I don't have. Again, I always do the things the hard way. Good thing Joe's code is packaged into and executed from Python. Again, that also I started learning when I started my PhD six months ago. But I really like, really like Python, mostly because it's visually because of its visually appealing syntax, easy to learn and handle. Uh, and of course, it has extensive standard libraries. This is a, a example of a model that I obtained from from the code that I just discussed. It's a binary lens star with all those parameters over here. Um, the x-axis is, is the time in Julian days, minus that. And um, more than this kind of event, we care about such events, which we suggest that there are pla the, oops that there is a planet of 0 0.01 mass fraction and 0 0.77 um, separation. That's like 100, uh, the plan that suggests the planet is 100th of the host star. Whatever. Yep. Um, ongoing work or rather future work, uh, coming observation season which will start in March, March probably, and I'll be feverishly modeling these events. And I am also currently exploring the potential of intelligent search methods. The code that I just discussed, it, ha it uses um, methods, search methods such as grid search, um, downhill simplex, um, uh, Markov chain, Monte Carlo optimization methods. Now I need to, uh, investigate the potential of, um, currently I have been writing a genetic algorithm code and I have yet to see what advantages that offers when, when it comes to microlensing events. 
Okay. Thank you for listening. Um, Uh, thank you, Ashna. That was fantastic. Uh, does anyone have any questions I'd like to ask of Ashna? No? Yes, hang on. <laughs> Just a, a suggestion for uh, Nicholas. Buy the girl a K40. <laughs> Uh, a K20, uh, you will have a, there are K80s actually, it's the NVIDIA graphics card. It's just $5,000, so what's? <laughs> just $5,000 is still hard to get past a uh, research grant committee. <laughs> this is the problem that you deal with constantly, right? So um, one of the things which I did on purpose, which was to buy a Tesla K20, which I know um, the uh, Nessie guys here at Auckland have a cluster of these as well. So the idea is uh, we do our prototyping on machine, which is sitting in my office, mm -hmm. uh, and then if we need to roll it out to identical hardware on the Nessie cluster. This is before I realised just how good the local support was here at Auckland for HPC. I was thinking I had to do most things myself like it was 10 years ago. Now, because we have such good support here... <coughs> pardon? Uh, what does that mean? Okay. Um, and the, the, the point being is that that was a step which was, it turns out to be largely unnecessary um, and delightfully so. I'm pleased just to once again plug the resources and the help from uh, this university for HPC. Sorry, can I respond? Because it's for the good. It seems like you will. <laughs> but it's still polite to ask. <laughs> uh, there is, I um, have nothing to do with NVIDIA apart from they sponsor multicore world, <laughs> but how they do it. There is something called the academic uh, whatever program that they give you one of these toys for free. So the only thing that you need to do is to ask, and they give you one per year. <laughs> <laughs> right of reply, version two. Um, once again, since we, when I say we, myself and Ashna are not GPU uh, code specialists. The specialist is Joe Ling at Massey. Mm -hmm. If his code works on the new cards, then yes, we would. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any questions? <laughs> I promise this isn't about GPUs. Um, just wondering, because you've, you've started off with the maths backgrounds, and uh, then you went off into astrophysics. And now you're doing a computational science problem, kind of your approach to um, looking at microlensing. Um, how do you manage the multidisciplinary aspect of your work, particularly when you happen to do a presentation first at a Linux conference and then later on amongst your own peers at the university? Do you have any difficulty communicating all aspects of your research and the methodology you use, different audiences? Do I have difficulty? If you, are, if you ask me to go in much more detail, yeah, I would have difficulty. Off the top of my head, yep, sure. Okay, do we have any others? Yes, no, oh, okay, I think I'm closest, I might just, just keep your hand a little bit raised and we'll pop around to you. Um, this is a, a question, slightly more general, about this um, microlensing thing. Um, you know how the, the light bends to make a bright spot. Sorry. So the, the place where the light was going to go to, there must be like a darker shadow. Can you detect that? Or you, do, you can only detect the peak? Does that make sense? No. Well, well if, if, if the light is being bent to come to a point, or yeah. you know, a brightest point, yeah. then where the light was going to go to, isn't there a darker bit? Like the light do you doesn't mean, reach where it was going to? There are uh, <laughs> occasions where there are demagnification areas that we de detect in light curves, I think. Yeah. You want Sorry. to respond? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can we just bring the... Just down to me. Just, just down to me. Okay. If you could, yeah. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, but the question is more complicated. Um, uh, like Ashna mentioned, that there are there are regions of deamplification 
Um, we didn't see any of those in the magnification maps that Ashna showed in this case, but you're quite right. Yes, the light that was going to go to one place now goes somewhere else. Um, and my former uh, research group boss at Manchester did consider this question, although I don't know whether he actually got anywhere with it. Uh, so I can look at that myself and answer your question as to whether he got anywhere with it. So I'm curious where you're going to go next with your research, and I want your answer, not your supervisor's. <laughs> um, in the next three years? In the next three years or after that? As I said, I have been developing a genetic algorithm, um, yeah, which is going good so far. Um, I'll see where the research takes me. <laughs> it's just been six months, and I'm enjoying myself so far. So. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that the code that you're using at the moment is going to be released yes. as open source, yes. um, presumably when he's finished. So it is, I think, finishing in six months or so. But well, it takes more time to get your results published and so on. After that, any code that you work on, will that, will we all have to wait until you've finished? Yes. <laughs> before we see that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Isn't academic life grand? <laughs> <laughs> because, um, well, to release it, you have to repackage it so that other people can understand your code. <laughs> before that, it's just you who can understand the code mostly. <laughs> but yeah. Do we have other questions?